I'm Richard Payne from Holden, and I'm going to take you through the features of the Panasonic GH4 camera, which I've got in front of me here, and give you a rundown of, of what makes it such a fantastic HD and 4K camera for video, as well as, of course, for stills. So, um, without further ado, let me take you into the menu system, which will come up on the, on the screen I've got attached. Um, you can see the GH4 is, is bigger than usual because I've got it attached to this unit here, which is, I call it a Yagi, it's a Y-A-G-H-E interface unit for the camera, which, which gives it quad SDI out, uh, XLR audio in, which is balanced and has phantom power, and has a 4-pin XLR power as well. So it means you can power the camera in a sort of studio environment or 24-7 or if you want to. So we'll, we'll look into that in a bit more detail a bit later, but, but let me first take you through the video features of this camera and show you why it's, why it's so different and innovative compared with other stills cameras that can record video. So I'm going to go into the menu system here, and this is a, um, the first page of the menu where we've got photo styles. Now this is uh, something you'll be used to on most stills cameras, but as well as the standard styles of a, a digital stills camera, we've got a couple of video options here. Cine D is a very flat sort of grade. If you're going to grade afterwards, go through DaVinci Resolve or do some post-production on it, Cine D is, is probably your choice. I've actually lowered the contrast on this, the sharpness, noise reduction and a couple of other elements in this um, to make it look even flatter. And by doing this you can extend the dynamic range of the camera to some people claim about 13 stops, which is a hell of a lot for a, for a little camera like this. So if you want to shoot straight out of the box, I'd recommend the Cine V setting. So if you don't want to do post-production on your footage, then, then perhaps Cine V is a place to start. But of course, again, you can, you can change the contrast level, you can change the sharpness, uh, noise reduction, all these different elements of the picture, um, and then save these uh, by coming down to set here. And that way you can create the looks you want uh, straight out of the camera without having to do any post-production on it. Okay, record formats. You've got a terrific choice of formats with the GH4. Uh, I'd recommend the use of MOV format if you're going to edit on a, on a PC or Mac, Final Cut Pro, Adobe, um, if you're going to edit, if you know you're going to edit on a, a different program like Edius or you want to produce files which will play back in a Panasonic 4K television set just by putting the SD card into the frame, then you're probably best to choose this MPEG-4 setting up here. But MOV, MOV is very good. This is just the wrapper. The camera records H.264 into a MOV wrapper. So, so it's, it's still the same codec. It's still H.264, but it's, it's got a, a MOV wrapper, which makes it more Mac friendly. But also these days, MOV is perfectly accessible on a PC as well. So we can choose MOV. And then we come to recording quality. Now, this is where the camera is very different to anything else that's out at the moment. It can record internally. Uh, not only Ultra HD but also 4K. As you can see from, from this, it's recording 4K at 100 megabits a second. That's about a minute per gig onto the SD card. Um, but at 1080, uh, sorry, 3840 by 2160, 25p. So this is a progressive 25p signal, but 3840 by 2160. This is known as Ultra HD, not 4K. But the camera is capable of four, four, full 4K recording as well. So if I come into this setting here and go down to system frequency, we can change it to cinema frequencies. So we have to turn the camera off and on again. And then if I go back into my menus, we've now got this 4096 by 2160 mode. This is full 4K, a cinematic 4K. Now, this is um, as high a recording as, as you can get out of the camera, so 4096 pixels by 2160, but it only does it at 24 frames a second. That's because the 4096 by 2160 is a cinema resolution. It won't play back on pretty much every Ultra HD UHD telly which is out there at the moment. So it's, uh, you'd be safer shooting 3840 by 2160, but this, if you want to produce something for the cinema with that extra, extra wide um, aspect ratio, then 4096 by 2160 at 24 frames is the way you should be going. So I'm going to come out of that 
and I'm going to switch back to, to 25p. So you go back into PAL. I'm afraid we're going to have to go through the same process, switch off, and back on again. And we'll carry on using Ultra HD for the rest of this demonstration. So if I come back into my menu, I just need to go back to choose 100 megabit 25p 4K. The camera is also capable of recording HD at 200 megabits. This is an all intra, so every single frame, all the detail is recorded on every single frame. And this is 200 megabits. It can still be recorded to very fast, uh, very fast SD cards. You need at least a SanDisk Extreme Pro card um, or, or the new generation of Class 10 cards, which are sort of UH3, uh, to record at this data rate. But uh, that will give you 50p all intra recording. Brilliant for sports production. You've also got 100 megabits 50p. 50 megabits 50p, 200 megabits 25p, which is a sort of ultimate quality for, for 25p recording. And my favorite is full HD at 100 megabits a second. And that's because it allows me to do variable frame rate. And I can get this camera to record at up to 96 frames a second. So super smooth slow motion for very fast action sequences. So it's about a quarter speed slow-mo by, by shooting at 96 frames a second. And it's variable. See, we can choose an awful lot of speeds, um, frame rate speeds between 96 and 2 frames a second. This is great because uh, you can slow things down. You can slow it even further in post-production because you've shot at these higher frame rates. It won't... Um, it won't affect your, as long as you increase your shutter speed a little, you'll get very little blur on fast motion, but you, you have to see it to believe it. Just do a search on some of the slow-mo, which is available to see on Vimeo and YouTube. Right, so I'll come out of that, and we'll go back to our lovely 8 4K setting up top here, and take you through the rest of the menu. Exposure mode, I've got a manual, and by having it on manual, I can just use... Um, by the way, the reason this, this comes up, the AF performance may be temporarily degraded, is because I'm actually shooting 4K on the camera, but I've set the HDMI output connected to this television to HD. So the camera's doing an in-camera downsample, so the quality um, so the quality isn't quite as good, obviously, but a HD telly wouldn't be able to show the 4K signal from the camera. You need one of the new UHD uh, televisions for that. So let me go back into my menu, and we'll go through another couple of things. Continuous autofocus. This is very useful. This means while you're shooting video, the camera using one of the Lumix lenses will be continuously using the autofocus feature. Now, considering the autofocus feature will give you things like eye detection, so we can not just focus on a face, but focus on the person's left or right eye uh, to do very accurate autofocus during portraiture or, or an interview setup. Um, that sort of continuous focus means if I'm moving backwards and forwards, the focus is always going to hold perfectly. So go through metering modes. Uh, this just gives me a choice like you'd normally get, sort of center point or um, average or average but center weighted, you know, the usual sort of camera stuff. Each one of these menu settings will be described in the text up here, which is a very useful way of getting to know the camera. Just sit there, let the text scroll by and teach you exactly how to use it. So we come out of that. Highlight and shadow. This is a lovely way of extending the dynamic range of this camera. So you can see I can adjust the shadow dynamic range, and as you can see, I can pull more detail out of the shadows, and I can also adjust the highlights or crush my highlights to give me more dynamic range in the sky. So perhaps we can pull in some more detail on the clouds. Of course, you're watching this. It depends on the camera performance that's filming me, whether you'll see the dynamic range on this. But it just will give me the ability to crush my highlights to pull more details in my highlights on the sky. And also, I can boost my shadows so I can get more detail so I can see into the dark areas a little more clearly. So, so highlight and shadow control is, is quite stunning with this camera. It's a feature I've never seen on a video camera. It's very useful. And this is in addition to the uh, other contrast and gamma settings I can make in the camera. So go back into this, highlight and shadow, very cool. Eye dynamic, this is a, a, a way of automatically controlling the dynamic range of the camera. I found this to be very useful for getting the ultimate dynamic range out of it when there's tons of light about, for instance, if you're shooting a landscape. But I would turn it off for any other situation because it will probably produce noise by, by bringing up your shadows too much. Eye resolution, this is, a, this is an automatic sharpness enhancement. I, I don't touch it. I'd rather, rather do sharpness in post-production if I need to. 
Master pedestal, again, a very rare thing to have on a, on a stills camera that shoots video. So uh, master pedestal lets me set my black level. So I can either crush my blacks like this, or use it to match the blacks produced by other cameras, or I can see into the dark better. You can see how I've brought up the shadow level, and so I can see much more clearly um, anything in the dark. And I can always crush it later in post-production if I decide to. So master pedestal is another creative control, either for matching cameras or, or giving you the black point, setting the sort of knee point of the camera. So come out of that. Luminance levels. This is very useful. 0255 gives me the brightest or the, the largest range of, of luminance from, from pure white to, to absolute zero black. Um, but it's not a broadcast safe uh, set to use. You're better off using 16 to 235, which crushes your highlights a little and crushes your blacks. That's, that will give you broadcast safe colours. Or if you know your editor, perhaps 16 to 255, which means that you can get some more detail in your highlights. You'll be able to pull out some more detail in your skies, but the editor will have to clip it to make it broadcast legal. Right, let me just come out of that. Synchro scan, again, very handy. If you've got a, a screen which is flickering or a light source which is flickering, we can go into synchro scan and do a, a very subtle adjustment of the shutter speed to, to a terrific degree for getting rid of screen flickers or, or flickers in difficult lighting situations like sodium lights, things like that. So we come through that. Uh, digital zoom, won't touch that. Time code. We've got a couple of different time code uh, settings to use. We can set manual input time code where we can totally use it to define it ourselves or we can use the current time and date to set our time code. So, so good choices on time code and if you're using the Yagi box it will give you, a t you can have a time code input through a BNC connector, so like an SDI connector for giving you a um, time code in so you can match the time code on multiple cameras which makes it a lot easier doing a multi-camera shoot. There you go, time code. HDMI output. This is, again, an area this camera is highly unusual in. With or without the Yagi unit, which gives us the SDI, remember, and the balanced audio, we can get either 8-bit or 10-bit 422 out of the SDI. Note that if you choose 10-bit 422 from the, sorry, from the HDMI and from the SDI, but from the HDMI, you can't record internally at the same time. So if you want to record on the internal SD card, you need to set this to 8-bit. So at the moment that's going to switch to 10-bit and it automatically turns off all the screen information when you do that. So I now have to look at the back of the camera, switch back to 8-bit again so I can get my menus up again. But no other camera, um, even ones costing three or four or five times as much as this camera, will give you the, the equivalent value of giving you 422 10-bit through HDMI and through SDI if you have the Yagi box. We are also able to down convert, and that's how we're able to see the 4K output on this HD telly, because I can choose this option here to output 1080p instead of 4K through the HDMI output. So this silent operation here, you might think it's, it's maybe not too useful on a video camera, but actually it's probably more useful on a stills camera because you're able to take stills with absolutely no shutter noise whatsoever using an electronic shutter, which the camera has. This allows you to, to take a, a photo during a snooker match where the guy's actually queuing up, you know, uh, during golfers if someone's taking a putt because there'll be absolutely no noise from the camera. A, nobody knows you're taking it, and B, it won't disturb anybody. So silent mode it also turns off all the autofocus lights um, the recording lights and everything else on the camera so so nobody knows that when you're taking shots and when you're not so mic level display pretty obvious what that is it just gives us audio levels mic level adjust we've got uh, level control here but if you have the box the Yagi box then we've got audio level controls actually on the back with, with thumb wheels for, for controlling them so we've got a limiter, very useful if you're a bit of a lazy sound person um, because it will, it will crush too high a level. So when a builders are banging about outside, hopefully we won't be able to hear the worst of it when you're recording with this camera. So wind cutoff, again, very useful, if you, especially when you're using the internal microphones. There are tiny internal microphones built into the, the flash unit here because obviously a bit of wind across it because there's no dead cat uh, to, to muffle wind. Is it's going to give you a <laughs> noise. Wind cut will detect that low frequency rumble and take it off your recordings. Uh, this little setting here lets me choose, dependent on the style of work I want to do, a, a, an old K1 
cameraman like me might prefer to use seconds and dB for my shutter speed and gain operation because that's what I'm used to working with. Someone who's more used to cinema cameras could choose angle and ISO. So the shutter speed will be measured at an angle like a, like a film camera and the ISO for the, for the equivalent of gain for the sensitivity of the camera. Uh, or a nice compromise for everybody is shutter speed in seconds but ISO for gain. So, so that's what I'm going to leave it on. Finally we've got colour bars here and we can choose EVU colour bars or this newer setting or of course we've got NTSC style simty ones. So you've got a choice on choice on um, on signals you're able to produce from the camera which can really help you test uh, environments especially when you've got the Yagi connected with the quad SDI out that can be very useful. So the interface unit as long as you've got this Yagi box on the bottom you get this extra menu and you can choose audio from the body mics from the from the small microphones built in to the camera unit or XLR mics as I say with phantom power You've also got the choice for SDI triggering. So as you press record on the camera, it can send a trigger pulse through SDI to record an external recorder, like a Blackmagic Hyperdeck Studio. So we've got LED bright brightness. When we look at this in detail, you can see there are LEDs on the back of it. And you can just turn the brightness level down a little bit so it's a bit easier to see what's going on with that. And we've also got two different types of 3 gigabit SDI, level A and level B. This, is, uh, this makes the, the camera very compatible. Um, Sony prefers the, the, the level A and uh, Panasonic the level B. It will either do progressive, the 50p progressive over interlace or over um, or proper progressive, dependent on, on what devices you're going to. So, so a very high end of functionality here on the interface unit. The last thing we've got is a low battery alert because unfortunately the Yagi unit does have to be externally powered. So if you're using a battery on it, you can set exactly when, when the low battery comes on, the low battery alert, so you know to change your batteries. Or of course you can use it on a mains adapter like I'm here. And if you do use this unit, the camera doesn't turn itself off. It, it, it just carries on going endlessly, which is very useful in a studio location. So we'll come out of that one now and go into the next menu down. This gives us another few settings. There's this eye sensor setting here. This is a lovely feature which turns on the viewfinder. You just have to take my word for it. As soon as you start looking through the camera, it turns on this electronic viewfinder here. Now this is great because it saves battery life, but it also means that when you're um, when you're working in bright sunshine, you can see clearly see the screen. You don't need a loop or any external monitors to be able to see what you're doing. Even better than that, both the touch screen on the back of the camera and the viewfinder here, the electronic viewfinder, are OLED, um, organic light emitting diode screens. So the blacks are dead black, they're fantastic. The resolution is incredibly high and response is, is very swift, so, so there's hardly any delay. In fact, tiny fraction you can't see any perceptible delay in the pictures coming to this so you can almost fool yourself into thinking it's it's a mirror compact so that you, you know you're looking directly through the lens because the image is so good there's over two million pixels of resolution on the EVF which is makes it incredibly detailed and with the addition of things like focus peaking which let me put a green outline edge on, on anything I'm focusing when I'm in manual focus so by, by using this focus peaking, can you see on the screen here, it, we can see exactly where the focus is. Um, we can really be confident of our focus. There's also this expanded focus. So as I focus, it zooms into the center of the image. So again, I can be very sure that I'm getting the perfect focus with the camera. So. So let me go back to this menu. So eye sensor for the very, very high quality viewfinder. Um, touch settings here. And I'm going to show you some of the autofocus features of the camera now. Um, now autofocus, you know, to an old cameraman like me, is something you, you hardly ever use. But there are situations where it's important to use it. And this camera's got some very interesting autofocus features. Um, quite useful if you're going to leave the camera locked off uh, in, a, in a studio or in a, uh, you know, up a stick sort of situation. So let me go through them with you. If we choose the autofocus menu, we're in manual focus at the moment, so we'll change to autofocus, and you can see we've got this face eye detection setting. So if I can borrow 
one of my camera people, thank you very much, and just show you how the, the face detection works. So I choose OK. So it's not just uh, focusing on the face, it's actually picking an eye to focus on as well. And we can choose the left or the right eye. So just by touching the back screen here. So that the face and eye detection will lock on to, to facial recognition and then also lock onto an eye to give you the most perfect uh, focus for doing portraits and doing people. Now if I choose, thanks very much, and then if I go to the tracking, we can track a moving point now. So I can choose, for instance, the light stand, and it doesn't matter if I move the camera. And so it's lock onto that point. We can move the camera and it will keep tracking the point. It sort of uses pattern recognition to track the point. I must point out, when I'm doing down conversion, because this screen's only HD, it does degrade the autofocus performance. So autofocus is a lot better when you're shooting um, with a 4K output than if you're down converting to HD. It's because it uses a lot of the processor power and this camera's being used to do the down conversion to do such good quality down conversion. So let's choose another setting on my autofocus. There's 49 area tracking. So that's just a traditional autofocus which lets the camera decide out of 49 areas which one you want to focus. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is the custom free, which lets me decide which of the 49 areas I want to use for autofocus. So you can see I've chosen to use a light stand and then some other points, but I could equally choose not to use my light stand and to use different areas of the picture like this. So you can predefine exactly what points to, to autofocus on. Very useful for leaving the camera locked off, especially if it's in front of a light stand or something which you don't want to be in focus. So let me just come back to this again. We've also got a traditional one area autofocus where I can just touch the screen to decide what part of the image I want to be in focus. So a few different autofocus systems. Um, now the camera uses something called a new system Panasonic have developed called depth to defocus uh, in order to do autofocus, which means when you're shooting video or stills, it has very fast autofocus control. The way it does this is it looks how blurred an image is and by looking at the blur, and it can only do this with Panasonic lenses, uh, it will look at the blur and say that image is, is 50 meters away. And then by, uh, it will quickly move to 50 meters and then use contrast detection for the last couple of inches of focus to get it absolutely spot on. So that's depth to defocus. So if you're shooting stills, you can move the camera incredibly quickly, even in fairly low light situations, and get very good autofocus results. Right, so off autofocus, back onto good old manual, and as you can see, we've got this focus peaking, which gives me very sharp um, pinpoint accuracy for seeing what's in focus. Can you see? I can be dead sure that that's perfect focus there. And it also has expanded focus to zoom into the central area to make sure. So some really useful focus aids, whether you're using autofocus or manual focus. And uh, in addition to the focus peaking, this has also got uh, zebras as well for exposure. So you see, I can see quickly if something's over 100% if it's overexposed. Very easy to judge um, exposure and focus using, using a GH4. Okay, right, what else can I show you about this? So I really think it's probably a good idea to talk about 4K recording and what it's useful for and what it isn't useful for. Um, we've also got phantom power or line or mic level. So that's uh, the Yagi audio facilities here. On, over on this side, we've got four pin XLR power. So four pin XLR power here. for connecting to a 12 volt power supply. We've got balanced audio, two channel balanced audio. And under here, we've got time code in and then quad SDI out. Because the way to get 4K signal through standard SDI is to put it through four SDI terminals. So you've got each one of these terminals takes a quarter of the picture. So effectively, the first one is that much, second one is that much, third one and fourth one. So, so quad SDI means we can use standard SDI infrastructure 
for shooting our 4K pictures about, which is great for going through routers and, and things like that. So also on the YAG, there's the two connections here for, or two screw ports, so we can use a French flag or a map box on the front of the camera without needing a, a, a rail system. And we've got standard threads for, um, for attaching to tripods. So on the back of the camera, these, this is the very high quality uh, OLED OLED Let's go back, so it's got a picture on it. Uh, OLED screen, which is a touch screen, for, for, can be touch for focus or going through the menus. And the OLED viewfinder, which again is over 2 million pixels resolution on this, so it's incredibly good quality. And there's a, a remote terminal for, for starting and stopping the camera or, or controlling the lens, which is here. Another great feature of the GH4 is its Wi-Fi control. So we can press function one button on top of the camera and switch on a Wi-Fi network. And I've, I've logged my iPad on using a free Panasonic uh, app. And I can, I can see the live output from the camera on my iPad. And as you can see, there's very little delay. And I can do things like focus. I can change my autofocus point from, from the screen there to, to the window catch. And I'm seeing other features like I'm seeing the peaking and I'm seeing the zebra here because it's, uh, it's overexposed. And I can change my shutter speed and my, my f-stop number here uh, very dynamically and easily. I can also change the ISO. So we could drop down to 400 or 200 ISO here if we're overexposed. Um, we've got full control over the camera just from using this Wi-Fi app. There are some Panasonic uh, servo zoom lenses as well, so you can even control the zoom remotely as well as seeing the live feed and, and changing all the other settings. So, so the Panasonic image app is a very useful way of controlling the camera remotely. A lot of people think it might be problematic to edit the 4K footage produced by a GH4. But that's, that's not true. Um, most applications, uh, most up-to-date applications, are capable of editing 4K quite happily. Uh, and my laptop is, is about three years old, and it's, it's easily capable of, um, of working with the 4K footage. Because the camera is only recording 4K at 100 megabits a second, that's, um, that's about a minute per gigabyte. It's, it's not throwing about a huge amount of data, so you don't even need to have an SSD in here to work with it. Um, I've put my SD card into my laptop and I'm using Grass Valley Edius to have a look at my 4K footage, which means as soon as the card's in here, I can see, see any of the shots, I can double click, I can check them, play them back, just check everything's okay. Here's a, here's a close-up shot of my watch, which, which I did in 4K. And to look at it full screen, I can double click on it like this, and we'll get the, the 4K shot uh, playing full screen, screen on my laptop. But don't forget, we've got footage here which is four times, has four times more detail and picture information than HD. So you're actually able to zoom right into an image and retain full HD quality. And this is what gives you a terrific amount of flexibility in post-production. So I can choose this shot of my watch. Let me just move along a timeline here. Choose the shot of my watch and place it down onto the timeline. And we'll just crop mark an in and out point on it like that, just shorten the shot, the shot like that. And then I can use this layout filter to punch into my image, to zoom into it. And we can go in a long way while still retaining full quality of that image. So in HD it's still going to look good even when you're zoomed in by quite an extent. So Effectively, by shooting 4K and editing on an HD timeline, you are able to zoom in to 25% to, uh, of the pictures, sort of do a 50% zoom into the shot and still maintain full HD quality. So you can do an interview with, with one shot locked off, but do close-ups of the person's face, of their hands, of, of other detail within the image. So it's a great way of, of shooting, a, a, especially an interview on one camera, and then deciding later what parts of the shot to use. You can also, with a landscape shot, let me just move back to my landscape shot on my timeline here. You can do a digital camera movement 
like this. So I can double click and I can play it back. Now it may not play back perfectly smoothly because as I say I've got a three year old laptop but if you've got a, a fast modern processor it should be up to it. So this is just a preview of it, what it will look like. But we're able to zoom in to my landscape as if we did it when we were shooting it originally. Uh, so it's a, an electronic zoom into an image. Now if you do this with um, HD, the picture is going to degrade very quickly, but if you do it with 4K, you'll maintain full HD quality into the zoom. So the magical aspect of shooting 4K and editing it on an HD timeline, not only are you able to zoom in uh, in post-production to create different shots from your, your original shot, but also your 420 8-bit footage, which you've recorded on the card, becomes 444 color space 10 bits when you're editing it. So you actually improve the color fidelity and the quality of the footage by down conversion. You get rid of noise and you increase the color resolution. So you won't get banding in your skies, you'll get much more subtle color and much more subtle gradation on, on your tonal ranges. So there'll be more detail in your blacks, more detail in your color. Your blue skies will never go stripy and bandy and you'll also be able to punch in you know, it's, it's wonderful working with 4K on an HD timeline. You must, as long as you've got a fairly up-to-date uh, Mac or PC, desktop or laptop, you'll be able to work with this stuff quite happily. So, so that's it really for the, the GH4. Um, the key features to remember, you can get the Yagi box to give you quad SDI and timecode in and balanced audio. You can record on a low-cost media on uh, SD Extreme Pro cards from SanDisk or on the latest generation of Panasonic Class 10 UH3 cards. You can record very high quality uh, HD or you can record 4K at up to 30 frames a second. You can also do slow motion at 96 frames a second. You've got great video camera features like peaking, uh, like uh, zebras when you're, when you're setting up exposure and focus. So all round this is the first stills camera which I would trust to use, uh, to use for video. And don't forget, it's also a very, very high quality stills camera. It will take perfect 16 megapixels stills, uh, as certainly as good as my Canon cameras of the past can do. So, so it's a very flexible all-rounder for people who want to shoot both stills and video.